Hi, this is James Zhang, and today we're going to be talking about to KP or not to KP. So a KP is a key principle. Um, we're going to be talking about why they're needed, um, advantages and disadvantages of becoming one, and then if after going through all that, you still want to become one, how do you become one? Um, so a key principle really sits in between a general partner and a limited partner. Um, so a general partner, they're going to sign on the loan, they're going to find the deal, they're going to negotiate the deal, they're going to receive an acquisition fee, sponsorship equity, they're going to control the deal um, the whole way through. And um, a key principle sits one step below that, right? So they're going to sign on the loan. Um, they may have asset management control. They may control investment decision timing. Um, and they potentially could receive a fee. Whereas, you know, the lowest in terms of investment is a limited partner, right? They're not signing on the loan. They're not negotiating anything. They're not managing anything. Um, but they receive all the tax benefits of um, owning real estate. And so a key principle um, is really the general partner is going to be considered, quote unquote, a key principle. But then there's also going to be a one step below that where a key principle potentially could be in um, signing on the loan, but not have all of the control that a general partner has. And so that's what we're going to talk about is really that middle slot of key principle in today's video. So why are key principles needed? Um, so when you go out and get a Fannie Freddie loan, remember that your net worth and liquidity matters, right? So net worth needs to be equal to or greater than the loan amount and liquidity needs to be 10% of the loan amount or greater. And you also need multifamily ownership experience. So if when you go out and you don't have one of these things, you need to form your sponsorship team to have all four of these pieces in order to qualify for the loan and buy the deal. So let's just go through an example. I think this is the easiest way. It's a 200 unit deal, $20 million. Um, let's say I give you a $15 million loan and you need to go out and raise $5 million in equity, right? So most general partners aren't going to just have a $15 million net worth. And then after putting $5 million down, uh, they're also not going to have 1.5 million in post-close liquidity. So it's going to be um, hard to buy this deal on your own. So they're going to form a sponsorship group and it might be five people, it might be six people putting this deal together and so that their sponsorship group can qualify for this loan. So I use an example on the bottom of, all right, let's find four investors and split up the compensation. Let's say, let's say you're taking 20% compensation on this deal. You know, the first investor one, they maybe found the deal, right? They found the deal, negotiated the deal, got it under contract, and they're raising equity. That person's going to get 9%. 9% um, is going to go to the guy with multifamily experience, right? So they're going to have to qualify for the loan, and you need somebody with multifamily experience and the ability to raise equity. Let's say they're raising a majority of the equity, then they're going to get 9%. Now, the third investor um, is only going to get 1% of the equity because they have net worth and liquidity, which is great, and they're raising maybe a small percentage of the equity or investing equity in the deal. And the fourth investor, let's say you needed one more investor to get over, let's say, a million or $2 million net worth and a couple hundred thousand in liquidity. They might just be signing on the loan to get sort of quote-unquote experience and not necessarily, um, they're not really bringing a ton to the deal because there's a lot of people with net worth and liquidity that would be willing to sign. And so they might receive 1%, they might receive nothing. Um, so this is sort of just a example of how um, the sponsorship comp could be split up, but it's obviously always negotiable between those investors. And so why does a general partner need KPs? So we talked about it needs it um, to meet the net worth and liquidity requirements of the loan. But then it also, there is a 10% cash equity requirement for most lenders. So if we go back to this example, if you're raising 5 million in equity, they're going to want to see 500,000 of that 5 million in cash coming from the KPs. So some general partners may have all that 500,000 and sometimes they might not. And so that they might be trying to hold back some liquidity uh, for a rainy day or for future deals. So having um, KPs come in and put in some of that money helps. Um, so what makes an ideal KP candidate, if you're sitting there as the general partner, you know, who should you, who should you sign with on the loan or who should you have signed on the loan with you? Um, obviously strong net worth and liquidity, right? So you really only want maybe three to five KPs per deal, the less, the better. Um, so on this particular deal, if you're trying to get the 15 million, let's say divide that by three, you would want most people to have a $5 million net worth coming into the deal. Um, high credit score, so 650 or higher, 
you want U.S. citizens because um, if you do not have a U.S. citizen, that requires you to get a waiver from Fannie and Freddie. You want no bankruptcies, no foreclosures, no do and lose of foreclosures, no lawsuits or previous or current. And then you want them investing cash in the deal, right? So if the deal, let's say the minimum is 50000 you really want them in the seventy-five dollars to $100,000 range to really set them apart and then obviously help you get to your 10% equity requirement that most people are going to, most lenders are going to want. And so from the KP side, you know, like what are the advantages and disadvantages of being a KP? You know, the number one advantage is that this is more considered ex experience from the agency side, right? So it sort of punches your card that says, all right, you know, I've, I've signed on a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan. And this is one step up from being a limited partner. So that helps definitely um, in sort of getting that experience. Number two, you might receive a portion of the equity um, compensation or the acquisition fee. So um, that improves your return, obviously. And then you should be able to learn more about not only the loan process because you're closer to the general partners, but then you know making decisions. Hopefully you can get it, talk with the general partners and learn more about the deal, more about the property and asset manage the property if possible. Some of the disadvantages of being a key principal I would say is, look, um, you know, they have people signing for a reason, right? So um, if the loan does turn uh, recourse um, for forever, what, for whatever reason, um, and we're going to talk about that, sort of the carve outs where your loan could turn recourse. And so what that means is, if we go back to the slide, if the property that you bought for $20 million, if the, let's say, for whatever reason, the value drops to, let's say, $14 million, and then your debt is 15 million, then that difference between what the lender forecloses and sells the property for, that deficit between what you owe, let's say 14 million is what it sells for and you still owe 15 million, that million dollars you are responsible for as the KP group. And so all the key principles, they have the potential to go after you personally um, if you do any of these things, right? So that's what I'm gonna talk about in terms of non-recourse carve-outs. Um, below. And um, the second reason, the second disadvantage is if the property performance is negative, it would impact your ability to do future loans. So when you fill out a KP form, you're really filling out a personal financial statement, you're filling out credit authorization, and then you're also filling out a schedule of real estate. And so going forward, if this property that you signed on as a key principal um, has a negative debt service or lower than a 125 debt service, and the LTV is 95% or 100%, then they're going to look upon that negatively um, than if you were just a limited partner. So being a KP, it, you get the good and the bad with it. Um, and then in terms of paperwork, you're going to have to fill out personal financial statements, schedule of real estate, credit authorization. You have to sign some forms. You have to send them in. Um, so you're going to have to be around during the loan process. Uh, you can't just uh, send in your forms like a limited partner. You're going to have to be around answering questions and things like that. And then annually, typically have to do like a personal financial statement update as well. Um, so let's talk about that disadvantage number one. And in terms of the loan might turn recourse, right? And so when would a loan turn recourse? And here are some examples of some of the carve outs that are part of being um, signing on the loan. Um, number one is if the general partner gets the rents or security deposits and doesn't use it to pay expenses, that could be, um, you know, a way that it turns recourse. If you don't uh, maintain insurance or if you get a big insurance settlement statement from proceeds, let's say you have a fire and you get $500,000, but you don't use it on the property, that could be another reason it turns recourse. Um, not sending in financials. If there's gross negligence or you just um, materially misrepresented um, the property or yourself, then that could be another reason for um, the loan turning recourse or if you file bankruptcy. So for any of those reasons, if the general partner does any of those things, the loan could turn recourse at the, um, you know, at the decision of the lender. So after all that, you've looked at the advantages and disadvantages and said, all right, look, I still want to be a KP. This is uh, what you need to do to prepare. Have your personal financial statements, so PFS, schedule of real estate, resume. You need, they're going to ask for bank statements. So the last two months of bank statements, they're going to ask, they're going to run your credit. Um, they're going to ask about your history with bankruptcy, lawsuits, foreclosures, and your citizenship. And really, you have to start networking with general partners. 
and figure out who needs somebody with net worth and liquidity to qualify for loans. And then if you can help uh, with assisting in the equity raise, that'll boost your ability as a key principal. And then also if you can be close to the property, if you're local to the property and can help in asset management in any way, then that'd be another reason why you can raise to come to the top, right? Because on a lot of these deals, general partners are gonna send out an email to their list and say, look, anybody who raises their hand as a key principal, let me know. And they might have five, 10 people raise their hand and they probably only need two or three. So if um, you wanna be chosen as those two or three, then you're gonna have to um, sort of separate yourself and differentiate yourself, not only with your net worth and liquidity, but with some of these other items. Um, so that is, in a nutshell, what a KAP is. And you know, if you have any questions, let me know. You know, my background is as a loan underwriter, as a mortgage broker, um, originating over 800 million in multifamily loans, and also investing in properties as a limited partner across 21 properties in DFW, Austin, and San Antonio. So um, definitely subscribe to the channel, like this video, join the email list. And if you need help um, with a term sheet or deal review, uh, send me an email and uh, we can set up some time to talk and go from there. Thanks a lot.